Hey, Last in Line Nation. Welcome to another episode of Project 222, uh, where we are knocking it out of park with some MVP ex-athletes from college who manage their faith, Christian athletes that, that know the same struggles you're going through right now, that know the same challenges and distractions. And I don't even... I don't even apologize for sounding like a broken record because I say it every time, but man, there are temptations, there are distractions, there are challenges. And as a Christian, it makes it even harder sometimes to walk that path. And so some of these athletes that we have, them all, all of them have done it and they all know what, what it's like. So I bring to you a uh, really good guest today. Uh, I remember watching him play and just light it up. Uh, you know, he, he was a video game at times when he was uh, in college playing. And, and Matt Davis here uh, was a five-star recruit uh, in, out of high school and went to Texas A&M. At quarterback, uh, superstar, and uh, transferred, had some challenges and uh, some things that came up that wasn't a fit and, and transferred to uh, junior college and, you know, uh, ended up – ultimately being at SMU and had some really good success there. That program was on the uprise and, and man, he was a part of, of taking that to new heights and just lighting it up on the, on the screen uh, every time he was out there. But I will say, so this guy knows what it's like to overcome some stuff. Um, had pretty much every level of, of athletics, athletics that he was in had an injury. So high school ACL, broken foot junior college ACL senior year of college still managed to make it to some training camps in the NFL and tried out for every team I believe uh in in 2018 is that right uh yeah, absolutely. yeah that's a lot of, that's a lot of tryouts man and so sometimes you just know when it's time and your body is telling you Hey, it may be time to to go a different direction. And so he, you know, he went to mini camp with the Rams and was in the Canadian League for a little bit. But uh, this guy knows what it's like to overcome, to face challenges, to be hit right in the face and be told basically your dream is is coming to an end. So we're gonna unpack that and kind of look behind the curtain with Matt Davis today. But formally uh, right now, he's a, a manager at an oil and gas software company, so he's doing it uh, in the professional world. He's leading, and he's he's making an impact. But formally, I want to introduce Matt Davis to the show. Hey, John. Thank you for having me, man. Man, it's cool to have you. It's cool to meet new people. It's cool to finally put a face with a name of all the headlines and things I watch on television, you know, back in the day when you were playing. But, um, yeah, so – you know, when we go into this outline, this this outline is right out of, of 2 Timothy 2, 2, where it talks about, you know, take, Paul mm -hmm. says, you know, take what I've taught you, teach it to other people so that they can teach others. So obviously it's, it's downstream discipleship, blessing. Um, it's just impacting those behind you that maybe could avoid some of the same roadblocks that you had. So Man, is there yeah. anything about you though personally that is different that it, maybe we didn't add to the to the intro that something people might not know and would want to know about you? Yeah, I think um, I mean uh, there's a few things. Um, uh, I got a beautiful wife, so I'm married. I don't have a, don't have any kids unless you consider my uh, 15, 115 pound Rottweiler. So uh, he's a, uh, he's just like a baby. Uh, I do happen to be a uh, a minister uh, pastor. So. Um, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do that. Um, and man, uh, I think, uh, what, what you said was so important, um, because, uh, about passing it downstream and discipleship, I think discipleship is something that we've lost in, um, um, in the body of Christ in the church in the global church. Um, I think it, we become a lot more individualistic than, mm -hmm. than over time than we, than we've, uh, focused on you know, really building up other people to run the race. Um, and I think that a lot of us, um, that this new wave and this new generation that's focusing on this discipleship um, is, is being birthed from a place of not being discipled and knowing that, you know, what it is to, to not have that. Um, and so, for instance, what you were saying is about just as far as coming over, overcoming adversity, which I know we'll get into um, later. Um, but I, when I've spoken at different conferences and to different young men, I always told them, you know, I tell my story and they'll be looking at me just like, you what? Like this? And I said, hey, 
I would do it again three times over if I knew that y'all wouldn't make the same mistakes I made. Wow. Because if 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 I went through all this all this hell and then I tell you about it and you don't avoid it, then it makes what I did in vain. It, it, it was no purpose and no point. Yeah, I learned from it, but I'm just one man. You know, if, if we can teach people and then you can teach somebody, my, my old coach, you say a life touches a life that touches a life. Mm-hmm. And you never know which life is in that, is, is in that, is in that segment. So, uh, or in that sequence. So, yeah, I mean, it's adversity, but uh, I mean, hey, it's, it's, as long as we're learning from it and passing it forward, that's good. Uh, it, it makes it look, uh, it makes it worthwhile. Yep. 100% agree. Uh, man, so before we get down to the nitty gritty, uh, let's have a little fun with a little quick kind of rapid fire lightning round here. So you're going to enlighten the audience. Let them, we're going to invite them in as part of our family today because we're going to get to know you a little better. Uh, something off the field about you. So in lightning round. So nutrition. Okay. All right. I'm going to put a spin <laughs> on this one, but uh, let's talk about your favorite food. Let's talk about your absolute most detestable food that you can think of and then i want to know what your what the weirdest food you've eaten is all right hold on so you said my favorite favorite yeah what's the most favorite food so oh man so i i I should know this because i I do this with my wife all the time we go through our top fives It, it it changes so it has to be uh either street tacos sushi or uh, fried chicken and French toast. That's one of those three. Okay. Yeah. All right. Worst food. Worst food ever that never touches your plate. Uh, chitlins. I, I, I'll never do it. Okay. I, well, yeah, I won't do it. My my family's from East Texas, and I can't do it. Man. I won't do it. I I can't either. I've I've wanted to try some different stuff like that, and I just I just can't. You know, just can't do it. Yeah. And so, audience, do not. For for Matt's birthday or any sort of special occasion, <laughs> do not have chitlins yeah. catered catered to Matt. Okay, so we got that. Please don't. Like, please don't. Have you eaten any kind of weird stuff like on a trip or any sort of weird food that you've experimented um, with? Yeah, man. So I would say that I remember. I'm not proud of it, but I remember when uh, I was visiting a college one time. Uh, we were on a official visit. And kids just started ordering food. And that one of their dads came over like, hey, you should order those Rocky Mountain oysters. Oh boy. And I was like, I know what and that I was is. like, <laughs> and I was like, uh, you know, me, I'm a real skeptical guy. And I just remember that I uh, I cut it and I went, I took like a small bite, and then the guy told me what they were. Yeah. And I spit them out. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can't. So if that counts, then that, then, that that's does my count. answer. That does count for sure. Yeah. And you guys can Google that, what, what Rocky Mountain Oysters are. Uh, sorry, all right, moving on now. So you played for a couple <laughs> different teams. And, uh, you know, we got – so the next N is nuisance. So you played for some, some teams. You played against some really good teams. Um, who was the biggest pain in the butt? Like, who was the biggest nuisance that you couldn't stand playing? Was there a team oh, that, that fall in that category? Yeah, I would. Um, the toughest team to play for me was always, uh, and I, and I hate giving them credit for that. Well, let me let me say the toughest team that I the team that we had the most trouble with would be, um, like when I was at SMU, it would have been like uh, it would have been Memphis or okay. somebody like that. I mean, or you know, I wouldn't. We played TCU, we played Baylor, we played A and M, but I mean, we 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 fought with them. It was good, but. I don't know what Memphis has had our number, but the okay. best team I probably played against, I'll say it now since I don't have to play them anymore, and I and I knew a lot of those guys, it would have been that 2015 U of H team. They could play. That's the team that beat OU in the in – in the, uh, Oh, yeah, the, uh, don't bring that up. Yeah, don't bring that yeah. up. I try to erase that from Let me tell you something. They could play. They could. They, they, they were ballers. They have yeah. one of the best defenses I've ever, I've ever seen. The best team I, I've I've ever seen in my life though was my 2012 AM team that when wow. we beat Alabama. And then wow. we and then we beat the breaks off of Oklahoma and the Cotton Bowl. So all right. All right. <laughs> well, I think we're gonna move right along here. No, you that's absolutely <laughs> right. But uh yeah, okay. So never. The last one is never. I never mm-hmm. have done this, but would love to. Oh man. Um, 
I'm not a fan of heights, so I'm, it's not skydiving and stuff like that. I don't know. I think uh, it would just be travel more. I mean, I don't know if that's seems yeah, kind of boring. That's good. Oh no, I'm, I've never sat courtside at a. I have a bucket list. I've never sat courtside, and I've never sat ringside at a, at like an MMA fight. So Conor McGregor fights this weekend, so okay. that's a, that's a bucket. That, that's that's on my one. bucket list. That's a good uh, one. All right, man. Well, s super uh, answers. I like that. Uh, we went a little different direction with the Rocky Mountain oysters. Uh, I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad we touched it. <laughs> All right, man. So, so now let's get into leadership a little bit and kind of set the stage for your journey and kind of put some framework on this conversation. Mentors and leaders, like who were some of these people that you looked up to, uh, you know, even in even before college or in college, like people that you took a few things from and, and made them your own. And then you've implemented them as a leader. Who can you talk about? What can you take from those people? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the, the first and obvious one is going to be my dad. Uh, you know, my dad is the best man I know uh, taught me um, who God was, taught me how to love God, taught me how to be a man of God. Uh, and but also one thing that he also taught me leads me to the second part of it is that I can learn something from everybody. So I had um, inadvertent mentors. I had people that I watched and I studied that had no idea that I watched and I studied. Mm -hmm. I had people who um, meant a lot to me all the time. And like I said, so I just um, I'm obsessively observant. That's why I like to say. I just always watch and I always, and I was, so um, a couple of those people and people, I learned from people that I didn't like, which is something that a lot of people, a lot of people don't, 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 yeah. don't like to hear. I learned from people that I didn't like. I learned from people who didn't like me. I learned from people who didn't, who, who I might've been more skilled than, or I learned from people who are better than people my age, younger. Uh, but one of the people, one of the people when I first got to college uh, was a guy who ended up playing for Cowboys for a little bit. His name was Jamil Showers. He was a quarterback um, at a when I first got there. Jamil taught me how to navigate. I came in as a really arrogant 18 year old kid. And a lot of people didn't like that. And Jamil was one of the ones that kind of like, hey, sit down, let's talk. So um, he was one of those guys, another guy named CJ Jones played at, at a &M. He's a huge fitness coach out here in Houston now. Went to the same high school, but he's four years older than me. He did the same thing for me. Yeah. Um, well, so I was just gonna say, what, 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 what about them? What about them? Like one or two qualities that you kind of held on to? So what Jamil was, is Jamil was poised. And Jamil was a hard worker. Like hard isn't even a word. Like Jamil used to lift with Jake Matthews and Luke Jokel, the linemen. Like he used to get it. So um, that's why I ended up getting paired with the linemen. Because I saw Jamil and I had to, I had to work. And even though that we were competing, so to say, um, he was a big brother to me. So he was he was pulling me along the way. And Jamil wasn't the guy that if he had a bad day at practice, he hoped I did bad. He mm -hmm. wanted Matt to be the best Matt that I could be. So that was good. So he and then he and then he was poised. He was a poised guy. He was humble, um, and he was a leader. And not only was he a leader, um, uh, he was somebody that was worthy to be followed. So even nice. me being a leader. I still, because um, there's a lot of people who get they get they get put in leadership positions and they don't deserve any type of platform whatsoever. And I'm not yeah. and I'd say that any of us are deserving, really. Sure. Um, but uh, some of us are, are are probably a little bit um, more equipped to be leaders, shall I say, than That's others. A good word. Others. That's a good word. Yeah. yeah. Good way to put it. And uh, yeah, and other people, um, you know, some people just um, th their motives and their intentions and their capacity in reality. Is, it shouldn't be something for leadership. So Jamil had poise and leadership and hard work ethic. Um, CJ CJ had um, just brotherly um, proximity and, and, and direction. He was the one that could speak to me and relate to me because we were from the same place. Yeah. And I could, I could hear him and he would look out for me and say, Hey, watch out for this. Watch out for that you know what 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 watch out for this and so that's good um yeah that th those are two guys from the young part of my life and then i had yeah. some coaches as i got to smu that were well, big co coach step and then true carol 
Yeah, man. Uh, I'm glad you said a couple of those things in there because it leads us into a good, good spot of the conversation. So you mentioned you got a guy that's kind of helping you see some blind spots. Like, don't, don't do this. Don't go here. You know, that guy, eh, you might want to steer clear, whatever kind of guidance. But I love the fact that you, you talked about like, sounds like servant leadership, uh, when your teammates aren't wanting you to do bad just because they are, that's a good that's a good example to set in in the work ethic. But talk about some of the challenges because let's be, let's be honest, you had a little bit of an unorthodox journey right through your mm-hmm. college football career. A um, and M, top of the world, then a little bit humbling to go to a JUCO. I would I would think from that, and then to go back to SMU. So. Talk about a little bit of some of the challenges that you faced. And then I have an, another follow-up question about that. But what were some of the temptations, challenges during those times? And and did you have any just circumstances that you just kind of wish you could undo type of thing? Um, so I answer those questions in reverse. So do I have anything that I wish I could undo um, for kicks and giggles? Yeah. But in reality, no. Okay. Because um, – I'm content and I'm, I'm, let me see, I'm content and I'm proud with, um, with the potter did on the other side of the wheel. I got you. Yeah. Good. To not want to. Now, it wasn't fun being on the wheel, <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what it was that, that he created on the other side. Um, so now I wouldn't change that. To, but to go into, yeah, there was a lot, man. Um, I, like you said, I, being a five star and then going, in, going into, um, what I deemed to be, even at that time, one of the biggest programs in the country and one of the best yeah. programs in the country, from facilities to equipment to fan base to talent, uh, it was all top tier, first class. Yeah. And 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 there's classes to first class, and we were in, it, we were in the first of the first. It was it was great to go into junior college, um, to where you have to choose whether you're gonna wash your pants or your jersey after practice, to having one pair of cleats, to living in. Um, dorms where it's community bathrooms i have my own apartment i live by myself like th- th- there were so many things that went and i cried almost three or four times a, a week when i was there it was it was it was the roughest time in my entire life and so what were i to what was i tem- tempted to be uh i was tempted to be discouraged which i which i i, I lost that battle a lot of times i was tempted to lose faith, which I lost that battle a lot of times. I was tempted to be depressed, which I was for an, an exuberant amount of time. Um, I was uh, just – I just wanted to kind of just – Juco really tests whether or not you want to play. Right. And um, – In every sport, you, I would say every in, sport. In every sport. Because, like you said, you know, with your son in baseball and, yeah. and, um, and, I, and, some, and I know my brother played uh, basketball. And so, uh, but coming from a big university, like if you just go to JUCO, it sucks, but that's just what you know. Like I got accustomed to this, to be brought into this. And I had to really decide, man, do you, do I really want to be here? Like I'm having to ride a bus, you know, like I'm, th- th- there's just a lot of stuff that's going on. And it showed me how, how spoiled and how blessed I was to be at another, another university. Um, and then going through enduring an injury and some, you know, some, um, some crazy coaching stuff was, yeah. uh, was different, but yeah. So that, that, those are kind of the, yeah, that's some of the temptations there. Definitely, man. Uh, and, and I, I can guarantee that the audience, there are more than one pe- person <clears throat> that's going through that or has gone through it. So that was, that was good information and good guidance. Like you don't sit in the regret of like you said great analogy what happened before or during you're on this wheel being shaped and formed you you wouldn't change what came out on the other side of that and i think that's encouragement for somebody listening that man as dark as it seems right now it you know it's always dark as before the dawn right and so there's a light on the other side but you gotta you gotta lock into what you feel like god's trying to show you in that moment he's trying to mold and form and shape in that moment, right? And some of the best shaping gets done in the darkest times. Would you agree? Absolutely. And I think that, you know, it, it, even being, you know, here's a preaching becoming, but even biblically, we, we, we look at, at 
actual biblical principles and weeping man during the night, but joy comes in the morning. That wasn't just an encouragement. That was a principle yeah. that, 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 and, 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 but it doesn't tell us how, and it's, a lot of times it's contextually, we take that verse out of, we, we take that verse out of context. And what it is, is that it, we look at like, Oh, well, it was night already. So where's the morning, but the night is referencing the season. Yeah. So there, there may be seasons of weeping, but, but there, it does have to get better. You can go into the new Testament for that, that, that we know that all things work together for the good of those yeah. who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So we can yeah. get into, into that place. Um, so, but I would just a- encourage everybody in those situations um, still stand in the, in the preaching segment, but like even David said, it was good that I was afflicted, that I might know the statutes of God. Dave was saying that, that I, it was good that I was in a bad situation and, and things got rough and times were hard because in that moment, I got to learn who God was, that if I didn't, if my life wasn't going rough, I couldn't see that God was a comforter. If I didn't yeah. have lack, then I couldn't see that he was a provider. If, if I wasn't sick or, or hurting, then I couldn't see that he was a healer. Yeah. Um, so with those type of situations, that is, those are the things that give God his opportunity and his platform to come in and save the day and say, this is who I am. Like he told the That's Israelites, right. Hey, I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. That was yeah. me. He, he, yeah. he, he can do that. Yeah. All of that, you know, that battlefield, if you will, is really a stage for God Always. to show up. For God to show up and be the center of attention and and do what he does. And so I think that's a perfect way to say it, like you were referencing some of those scriptures. And and I think somebody needed to hear that because I guarantee you somebody right now is sitting in a, a cast of some kind or has just come out of surgery or is on crutches or watching this and they're they're doubting God. They're mad at God. And so what you're telling them is hitting home right now. And so I, I think that's something for them to build on. Um, did you have a time during that dark season? Did you have a, a defining moment? Like, did you have something happen besides the injuries? Like, was there a time where you woke up one day or maybe a week went by and you thought, man, I just have this overwhelming sense that I need to do blank or man i need to stand up and take ownership of this right now and make a decision with your faith did you ever have a time where you mm. could have gone either way and you said no nah, i'm gonna do this well um yes and no uh because i was still leading while i was bleeding for a long time um like when, when, when i got there can um, you say that again about, can you say that again i was yeah i was i, I was still leading while i was bleeding so I was, wow. uh, I was going through a, I was going internally. Um, I was going through hell. It was, it was, it was tough. I, it, it was really, really difficult, but externally um, I was still going through the motions to where other people couldn't see that everything was going on internally, um, except for, you know, um, you know, a, yeah. a couple of close friends of mine. Yeah. And, uh, but the thing that was really happening is because like, you know, my first couple, couple weeks there, um, I started, uh, accidentally started a Bible study with one of, one of my, one of my good friends, um, who I met there and it grew from four people the first time. It's so funny when you say it's project 222, um, uh, because we called it club 220 because, uh, that randomly, that was my dorm room number 220. Oh, yeah. And, um, uh, <laughs> and the first time we had, it was in there and previous, we, I mean, we used to have 15, 17 people in our small little Come 10 on. by 10. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Dorm room. And uh, people with six people sitting on the bed, some people sitting on the dresser. Um, and we had a Bible study and went from there in, in, into the lobby um, until about 35, 40 people bi-weekly, twice a week. Um, and so uh, I was still leading and teaching Bible study every, every week. And so my faith was, and, and, and here it is, it, my faith was strong for others, but it was weak for me. Um, I was... I could, it, there was, I had to change. So getting back to your question somewhat, yeah, that yeah. as far as did I have an awakening moment? I did, but it came later. It came well after I had left because for a long time, I had thought my faith was intact because I was able to serve and minister. Yeah. But I, but, but the thing is, is that um, I was somewhat believing in everything that God was, but just believing that he would do it for them, but he wouldn't do it for me. Yeah. That's so, popular. 
Um, yeah, and I think that that a, a lot of us, uh, man, yeah. that, that's a huge problem that we have a we have a faithless church that is, that that is that has been growing. Um, we have a faithless church, and it's almost like walking zombies. We have people who, uh, hey, I'm a Christian, but I walk and I don't believe that God can do what He says He's going to do. Yeah. Uh, hey, I, I I can go and pray, but uh, yeah. I I don't know if God really does love me because of X Y Z that I've done. And so yeah. you know, th- there's a uh, we have a <clears throat> huge and and this is not a point. And this is this is this is going back here too because um, I have. I uh, I do at times. I have to catch myself that I I'm you know I'm catching. I'm like man, I just uh, I don't know if I believe in as as much as I want to. I'm glad you went that direction because uh, it's almost like you you know you got to be something for somebody else, but you can't really position yourself to receive that same stuff you're wanting others to receive. And I think that's important to hear because. Uh, you know, not only will society feed that lie because of what they're telling, you know, oh, well, you know, God will do it for them, but you, you've done too much, you know, you're too far Mm -hmm. gone. It's too late for you. Your, your sin's too big. You know, we can hear all those fill in the blanks. Uh, and I think somebody listening to this, I mean, you don't have to be a college athlete for this to relate to you, but, uh, I think somebody's listened to this. Who's, who's sitting right in that space. I think their, their posture is, maybe defeated a little bit because they feel like they're watching everybody around them prosper and their faith is growing. And, but it sounds like to me, you had a choice to make, you had a choice to make in that season, in those moments, you're leading a Bible study, but let, yet you feel like that is, that stuff isn't for you. So you had to make a decision where, Oh man, so am I going to trust God and keep doing what I feel like he's doing? Or am I just going to throw up my hand and say, well, you know what? That's for them. I quit. So somebody right now needs to hear, don't quit. And somebody right now needs to hear, you had a choice to make. There's a fork in the road for you and your faith. So grab onto something that looks like faith, that that, that the promises of God, but you got to know what those are. So it sounds like to yeah. me, you had to create that environment, which you did. Whoever's listening, maybe you're not the Bible study leader, but somebody is out there that can point you in the direction of God's promises. And so that wasn't planned to talk about, but man, you led us in a perfect direction so as we kind of go into another transition here like talk to yourself let's put a mirror in front of your face man you're 18 19 going into college five star like that's no joke five star recruit um you know you probably knew everything right nobody could tell you anything so you could sit down across the table from you coming in to college as a high profile athlete Man, what are a couple things you tell yourself that you wish you would have known? Man, these are great questions, John. I hope. Uh, no, <laughs> no, they, they are. That's one of. Uh, it's so funny because people always ask me um, if I had two questions I can ask anybody in the world. One of them would always be, "What would you tell your younger self?" Oh wow! So that's so that's a you you. Nice. you I didn't this, know that. This, this I didn't know great. that. This is yeah. great. This is, <laughs> yeah. But um, what what would I tell him? Uh, I tell him a couple of things. Uh, I would say there's no such thing as pressure. Mm. Um, the, the, um, a lot of times I would find myself getting uh, performance anxiety because I mm. put yeah. the weight of the world on my shoulders to perform. Yeah. Um, and, and this is not just talking on the field. This is talking off the field. This is talking about my relationship with God. This is talking about in my relationships. This is talking about on the field that I would get to the point of almost paralysis because it's like, I have to do this right or else. Yeah. I have to, if I don't throw this out route right on the money, then <clears throat> I'm going to mess up and then I get pulled. And if I get pulled, then I don't play. And if I don't play, then I'll go to the NFL. And if I don't go to the NFL, then I can't do this. And I would find myself in these, in this huge fear bubble, um, all because it's a Tuesday practice, you know, <laughs> um, and things like that. Or, um, you know, making unwise decisions and really just thinking like, you know what, God just packed me up and sent me away. He doesn't care about me anymore. Um, you know, he doesn't, you know, there's, and, and so things like that, I would tell myself, there's no pressure. Pressure is, pre, you know, pre, pressure is, is, is a, it's a figment of your imagination. It's not real. Right. And only you can put pressure on you. You know, coaches can't put pressure on you. People think they can, but they can't because you yeah. have to re- receive and accept that pressure. Um, so I tell myself there's no pressure. And, 
And and then the second one, um, I would just say is it does get better. Because I, I went for a time period, John, where um, I felt like I couldn't get a break for years. Injury to disappointment to discouragement to injury to lies to deception. And it was like the moment you think you're coming up, if you see those people in the movies and they're in the middle of the ocean, they're drowning and they just come up <gasps> and they go, boom, it's the waves take them under again. I oh, feel yeah. like I only got time to just get a small bit of air. And then, um, but I, I would just let myself know it, it, it gets better. And it may not get better in a way that I see it because a lot of times we envision what better looks like and we create and we believe in what better looks like. And then we find ourselves believing in the better rather than believing in the God. And then when God brings us out into a better, it doesn't look like what we imagine. So we get mad at God. Yeah. And um, I had to, I would just tell myself that it, it, enjoy the ride. And I think that uh, uh, yeah. what that would do, I think that would have eased me up a little bit and I would have uh, been able to not miss the forest, but the trees. Yeah. For sure, uh, my, because it sounds like you had every opportunity to go the wrong direction. Like there's people right now that have been to the same fork in the road that you went through, and and they and I right did now. Yeah, they might. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe you did. And it's all about perspective. Even the pressure thing that you mentioned, like that's all about how you see something. Like what lens are you looking through? Like if this pressure is so much, then you're putting your value in something that a is earthly and temporal and will fade at some point instead of having that internal mm. eternal perspective. And, and it's easier said than done for a 20 year old kid. I know sometimes, but man, that's why we're here. That's why we're saying what we're saying is grab onto what's eternal, grab onto what lasts and what matters. All that other stuff is fine, but you can't, like you said, pressurize the situation enough to where you're in this vacuum. And now you've believed all this stuff that you can never live up to. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and all that stuff is like, it's like quicksand. Yeah. That, that the, the more you fight it, the more you sink. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the only way to stop that is from being still. Finish the sentence. I know I made an impact in the lives of my teammates because. Oh man. Uh, I could use a cheat code and say that because uh, for my 25th birthday, my wife went around, went behind my back and contacted all my friends and old teammates and had them send in videos to say, you know, what, it, what, 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 what it is that you, what, That's what is really I meant good. to them? And it was like an hour long. And I, man, I haven't cried as hard That's, as I've ever cried in my life. Wow. In my, and, and I'm, and I'm not even, gonna, I'm still looking for that tape that day, but I'm afraid to watch it because I might go into a fit again. Yeah. Um, best present I've ever received hands down. But uh, without that, honestly, honestly, John, I, I would say that, um, and it's one of the reasons why I needed to see it because I think that you never know. You never know. Um, I think you always, we always like to know and hope to know that we make an impact in my teammates, but people's life and just in, in, in general. Um, but you never know which, action, which word, which encouragement, which, which correction. I think for me, um, I just found comfort in them knowing that I had their back. Yeah. The retention yeah. of a, re of a relationship yeah. will show. And, uh, I think that's where it is. I think too, man, just knowing your story, what I know, like some of the ones that saw you going through situation that gave you an out, you know, a hardship that gives you an out and you, st you chose to lead a Bible study. Like you, like you said, you and your internally, you were fighting these challenges, but yet you still found a way to pour into other people. Like I think, and, and the beautiful part of your story, and that's a great present she gave you. That was a great idea. Um, but yeah. is that when you're doing it, the beautiful part of this is when you're doing it out of the right heart and the right motivation, who you impact slips your mind. Like you're oblivious to that because you're not doing yeah. it for that. So I think it's a, it's a great, like just one of those mysteries in the world where you may never know the people that you're impacting, 
but you're yeah. impacting them because you're not trying to, I, you're not trying to get the the praise or the acknowledgement or the attention from it. Right. But yeah. man, years later, you see the the harvest from the seeds you sowed and that's enough. Like that, ought, that really ought to be enough. Right. And, and that's, mm-hmm. you got to see that. So, man, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, Matt, man, it's been a, it's been an honor to get to know you and get to meet you and, your 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 wisdom and and some of your perspective on this stuff is is top shelf man is gold and i know somebody gets it somebody's in that place right now so uh i know the audience benefited from this and uh man i think there's going to be some things down the road for for matt guys that that he's going to be doing speaking i don't know why i just feel that heavy on my heart to say but i think he's going to be doing some speaking i think he might even have a book in there uh he's already a a minister so man it's been gold matt on behalf of the audience thank you until next time he's been matt davis we have been last in line be blessed